This is Dr. David Black, founding director of the American Mindfulness Research Association. My guest today is Dr. Patricia Tish Jennings, professor of education at the University of Virginia. She has served for over 20 years as a teacher, school director, and teacher educator. Her research focuses on teacher stress and its impact on social and emotional features of the classroom. She was awarded the Kathy Kerr Award for Courageous and Compassionate Science by the Mind and Life Institute in 2018. She has authored five books, at least that I'm aware of, and her most recent being The Mindful School and Teacher Burnout Turnaround, Strategies for Empowering Educators. Welcome, Dr. Jennings. Thank you. It's great to have you. So I have experience in teaching, and I think it's different, and I would love to hear your input about how it differs at um, the standard education and the years that you focus on. So mine is refined to just mostly higher education. I began 15 years ago in the community delivering public health education programs, and it was in prisons, it was in the community, it was trying, it was a diversity of behaviors. So that it's kind of a unique situation to teach the public. But then I move mostly into higher education, research, career orientation. So I've been focused there for the last decade. So I might be out of touch and I want to learn so much about primary and secondary education. So what, what education level do you focus on? And how is how has that been at teacher level director level and teacher of teachers level? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. I started my career as a preschool teacher. Uh, I was a Montessori teacher for quite a while. And so my first students were three to five-year-olds, um, which I still, I think um, when I think back to that time, that is my favorite age to teach. <laughs> um, however, you know, over the years, I've also taught elementary um, up through grade five, um, and also I've been teaching higher ed for quite a while as well, because at the same time I was, um, doing that, I taught as an adjunct, uh, in teacher education. So I've been doing adults and kids for a while. I think most recently, a parallel that I, that I noticed is teaching undergrads. I, I developed a course here called mindfulness and health and human development that has become a really popular undergraduate class. Um, We've ended up having two sections every semester because it's so popular. Uh, and I find younger uh, undergrads, like 18, 19 year olds, to be in many ways very similar to preschoolers. It's almost like they're preschool adults. <laughs> and there's a lot of parallels with them. You know, they're learning to develop their own identity as an adult, just like, you know, preschoolers are developing an individual, they're individualizing. Um, they're learning that they are separate individuals from their parents. Um, and I see that happening again at the, uh, you know, the young adult stage too. Uh, and there's a certain kind of openness and curiosity and flexibility of thinking that I find in both of these age groups in different ways, you know, they, but they parallel them each other in, in interesting ways. So, um, but primarily I think the biggest difference is that when you're working with young children, um, you have a level of responsibility that's really different than when you're teaching adults. There's a term called in locos, in loco parentis, which means basically you are the substitute parent for the child when you're caring for them and educating them. Whereas when you're interacting with adults, you're, you're, if they're over 18, they are adults, even though they're many adults in so many, so many ways, but they do have their own, um, uh, agency at this a different level. And so the responsibility isn't as I would say grave. I would, you know, I take working with young children very, very seriously because I feel um, when we do that, when we're interacting with young children, we have a very important responsibility, not only to provide a, a rich, um, engaging environment that, that will promote the best, the optimal development of that child, but also to model the kinds of behaviors that we are hoping to teach them. And that requires a lot of awareness and um, self-monitoring capacity. 
Uh, and that's why I got really interested in how mindfulness might help teachers, because when you're in that moment with, with these kids and you know that you have this responsibility, the demands of the classroom can be overwhelming and they can trigger a lot of stress that interferes with the capacity to do this. So that's, uh, that's where I've been focusing a lot of my career. So I, I enjoy hearing, it gives me some reprieve hearing that term you used about having a second parent, basically, because I have a three-year-old and we are talking about what I hope to be semi-post-COVID world. And we are returning to roles where schools are once again available to parents. And I realized how important that is to have an institution of schools at hand and nearby that are usable so parents can fulfill their multiple roles. And one of those roles that we were mentioning earlier is that parents do not have the capacities typically, especially in our context with two career oriented people to be teaching their kids. Like, I don't know what I should be teaching my son. I read to my son. We have fun. I play with my son a lot, but I don't know what a curriculum that he needs right now. Um, and so having a school and this term that you use for like having, taking the role of like secondary parent is a wonderful concept. I really appreciated that concept. Uh, so maybe we talk a little bit more about that and parents maybe who have a child in preschool. Uh, what does that role look like? So I, I do know my son's teacher and she's very nice. And you get to the point where you have, you built a relationship, but you do leave your child at school. And so what is, what's happening with say three to five-year-olds since you had experience there uh, when you, when a parent just drives off what are we expecting at that point? Uh, so there's a couple things that come to mind when you ask that question. Well, first of all, on one hand, you are the substitute parent. Um, and so in that sense, you, you um, need to cultivate a relationship with each one of your students that um, is based in really understanding the needs of that child and where that child's coming from. And also um, that how that child interacts with the other children in the classroom. So helping not only on an individual basis, but also um, understanding how they fit into the social environment and, and how to help them fit into the social environment. Because that's one thing that's really different in a classroom, unless you have a large family. Um, often the school is where the child's learning those social interactions and often they need help. And in order to do that, you also, so you have to be really aware of how the children are interacting with one another. And when there's a conflict or a problem, you need to find ways to help them learn how to solve those problems. Um, it's easy sometimes when you're feeling stressed to try to just fix the problem yourself because it's a way of being expedient. Like, oh, you both go sit down and calm down and then later we'll talk about this. And, and just, or just tell them, you go, you're wrong, you're right, we'll fix it later, whatever. Because you, you get, you get um, one of the major stressors teachers experience is something called time urgency, where you just don't feel like there's time. So I just have to solve it quickly, but that's not really going to help those children learn how to solve the problem for themselves. So um, when I, when I first learned to be a, a teacher, this is a, a funny story. I, I had this wonderful opportunity to work as an intern with a um, clinical uh, psychologist who was also a Montessori teacher. She had two jobs, basically. And she used to, when she saw me trying to interfere with children's own problem solving, she used to grab me from the back of my dress and pull me away and say, no, let them figure it out. So I learned really well how to when to, when to intervene, because one of the things is easy to try to intervene too early, watch them for a while, see how they handle the problem. And then when the problem starts to escalate, go in there and, and just be present for them, because sometimes just an adult noticing the conflict can change the interaction in ways that um, don't really require the adult other than just looking at that, you know, noticing what's going on. Um, because kids know when the adults are watching them that how they're supposed to be, be interacting, you know. Um, but then if it gets to the point where you really do need to intervene, giving the kids voice, offering them an opportunity to communicate with one another about what's going on, and then offering suggestions or asking them, well, what do you think? How do you think we could solve this problem? Um, and building that capacity for them 
to have the agency to solve their own problems, I think is, is really important. So in that way, I think often teaching is different than being a parent. The other part of that too, is that as this, you know, substitute parent, you want to, you want to have these, a good positive relationship, but you are not actually the parent. So at the end of the day, that child is going home to their family. So having a relationship with that family and having a relationship with the parents where you are partners in this process, rather than, you know, I mean, it's got to be a a partnership um, can be really beneficial to both the families, the teacher and the, the child, because then you can be more proactive. If there is an issue, if there is a problem, um, or if you even start to see that there might be a problem, you can, if you have a good relationship, you can give parents a heads up, you know, um, you can give parents suggestions. Um, the other thing that I think another resource, I think teachers can be uh, very um, good at is giving teachers or parents an understanding of what they might expect developmentally. Because if you're, if you only have one kid and you've never been a parent before, you don't know what an average three-year-old is like, you know? Um, And so sometimes you could, you can play the role of helping parents understand where their child is headed developmentally and how to support that process. So this is my world. We, I came from a large family. So I know, I know the sibling side. But the parent of two siblings, I haven't experienced yet. Uh, one on the way, and it's there's a little bit of an age gap. My son will be four years older. Um, so in a way, it's nice because there's a lot of conversations about what it's going to be like to have a sibling. Um, but from the perspective of seeing siblings engaged, the closest I've seen and what you were saying reminds me of school pickups that I do. Because I find myself in an environment where a lot of kids are taking interest in me, as as they do with any parent coming to pick up. And yesterday, so you enter one gate and you exit the other as a flow to leave campus. And um, I didn't know what was happening sometimes because you just you show up and there's events happening and there's like the end of snack time and you never hit it perfectly with the pickup. And all these students started running over to me and asking me all these questions and. I don't know what I'm supposed to do is I'm not supposed to intervene on these relationships and I'm just being nice and talking to the kids and then it's time to leave. And one of the children runs to the gate and opens the gate and starts leaving. And I'm like, Oh no, like, is this child going to escape right now? <laughs> I start getting nervous, but just staying calm. And I just asked the question because I knew the teacher was nearby and I said, what is happening right now? Right. And she was said, Oh, he wants to be the gate monitor. I was like, oh, okay, this is what's happening right now. And I surprised myself because I actually didn't know what to do in that moment. But just by asking the question, what is happening right now? I didn't judge anything. And then it ended smoothly because my son was happy to leave school. This child was happy to be the gate monitor. And there was no added conflict that I created as a parent. Um, So that's the closest I got to trying to manage the dynamic of what siblings might be like, just perhaps from my perspective, asking more questions about what is happening rather than judging. That's a, you handled that really well. I think, uh, like I said, it was a get, I, it just came, <laughs> it came up. I, and as I said, I was like, thank goodness it went that way. I, you know, I didn't want to make the kid feel bad. You know, um, I think this points to something really important related to mindfulness though, David, because I think when you practice mindfulness, you become more able to take those moments and give yourself space to not know what's happening and to investigate what's happening rather than jumping to conclusions based on some emotional reactivity, you know, maybe a panic or a worry that there's some danger or whatever, and then reacting in ways that, you know, maybe overreacting, right? (laughs) It's easy to overreact around children when there's things going on. And, And just asking that question, what's happening right now? Uh, I think it's a really good example of how mindfulness can help us in all kinds of contexts, you know? Yeah. And so mindful, I, and we'll, this is something that's a topic that both of us have explored. And yeah, I agree. That moment kind of was a gesture of what possibly mindfulness is in real life practice. It's answering, asking the question, what's happening right now without jumping on to judge and reacting by fear, because I did sense there was a moment of like, oh, this is someone else's child. What if they got hurt? And like, I could have like, hey, hey, get back in and like disrupted whatever that whole energy was and happiness. And luckily, I was lucky that it was it just came out the right way. And 
everyone tended to enjoy whatever that outcome was because the leadership role was held and my son was able to go home. Um, but it seems like, and I'll give you the approach that my school is using because I think it fits within your context of how mindfulness is being applied in schools, especially primary schools, um, which is we do have a person who's like mindfulness trained and serving in the role of like counselor plus aiding with the curriculum. And I find this interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a broader context that many schools are doing this is just my school. So you have this person who's like fitting these elements into the curriculum. And so just so I can fit that into the aim, and then I'll get your, your response to this. Um, they set, they align it with the expectations that they they set for students. And their expectation is, this is an environment of respect where you show kindness to others, right? And then everything starts at that foundation. If we can have respect for others and there's kindness here, then the learning can happen. And part of doing this is the flavor of mindfulness. Now, I'm trying to patch all of this together to some big term I think people are referring to as like social and emotional development. Can you like thread that? I know that's a lot. <laughs> thread that all together. Like what's happening culturally in the educational system? Well, you know, this this um, this area of uh, the curriculum that we now call social emotional learning uh, has become, um, it has grown a lot in the last, I'd say, especially the last five years or so. Um, it's been going on, this work has been going on for over 20 years now, but um, now it's becoming more and more accepted that to learn, I mean, the, the research has been made it really clear. A learning environment really requires um, that everybody in that environment feels safe and, and, and secure. If you don't feel safe and secure, we know that your the prefrontal cortex of your brain um, doesn't function as well because your limbic system is overactivated. And, and when, you, when you're feeling threatened, um, you're more focused on trying to defend yourself or protect yourself than you are to anything that requires a lot of focused attention, right? So um, now schools are adopting social emotional learning. Um, in Virginia, we just um, we just finalized standards uh, in the K twelve world now um, for the, the Department of Education. Uh, the other states have had this for a while. Chicago being one of them, probably the first place where it arose. But um, now uh, school. Uh, uh, Departments of education all over the country are now doing the same thing we're doing in Virginia. Um, and now with COVID also, it's made it even more important because COVID has disrupted families and created trauma and disrupted um, school contexts in ways that uh, to recover from this, uh, this challenge. I just heard the, the trier, which I thought I had turned that That's off. That's okay. Um, anyway, the, uh, it, it disrupted the social emotional context of the classroom. And um, with the, the support that's coming to the schools from the federal government, a lot of schools are spending some of that money on adding people like you're describing to schools. Um, here in our local area, every school now has a person like that, that you're describing, a counselor uh, who's engaged in social emotional learning. Many of them are also integrating mindfulness um, and compassion-based pra practices to support students. I'd say um, also in the last five years, there's been a, a growing understanding that mindfulness and compassion-based practices developmentally appropriate for children um, can support social emotional learning. Particularly, um, there's there's five dimensions that um, are targeted in social emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, um, uh, relationship skills, and decision-making. Uh, those are the five. And so um, we know that self-awareness is really important and mindfulness can really help when we're aware of what's going on inside us, whether it's our thoughts, whether it's our feelings, our physical sensations, all of that can the more aware we are of these internal processes and also the understanding of how they shape our identity and our 
um, understanding of ourselves. Um, that is, I think our, these practices really help with that. Um, it also helps with um, self-regulation because we now know also that the more aware we are, the more we're able to proactively um, manage strong emotions or proactively manage the inner interface between the emotions and the thoughts and how, um, you know, a strong emotion might trigger a ruminative process. You know, it's not that we're teaching children that at the level I'm describing right now, but we're giving them the capacity to um, be more, uh, I'd say, build this mastery that allows them to interact with others more, uh, more effectively and also manage emotions more uh, skillfully. So, yeah, I like those pillars. I just, as you're talking, I'm thinking about my son and all the things I want him to come home with self-management is wow, that, that was, you hit it right on. Um, and we work on self-management, you know, through breathing. If, you know, you set clear standards, set clear expectations for the house, uh, use incentive structures like the star system. And as a parent, I think we go through all of these things and try them out and some days they work and some days they don't. And some days there's timeouts applied. Uh, and if it ever makes it to the level of timeout, like I will often use, I don't know if we would call it a, a mindfulness technique, but it's using sensory base. I'll put my hand on my son's chest and say, we're going to make it to 10 and feel our breathing, which commonly might be in the mix of a, of a mindfulness practice to a degree. Um, and it, you know, you could see the process of the calming happening and I, that's kind of involved for something like that to be able to happen in the classroom. But also I understand that he doesn't act like this at school <laughs> coming from his teachers. I'm like, does he ever have meltdown? No, perfect. You know, he acts wonderfully. You know, the worst is that we just say stop and he stops. Can you talk about the importance of whatever is happening in the classroom? This is like um, a practice social world for becoming a young adult and adult, right? And then home can be seen as something else. And I really do think our kids can be different animals at school and at home, but we do know that there is, is carryover and overlap. Perhaps it's more important they do see a social world outside of the home. And then what can mindfulness do there? They're, they're self-managing in a world that's saying, this isn't my mom and dad. This is a real world with real consequences that my parents can't always deliver on. Uh, so what is, what is the importance of mindfulness in school in particular that parents may not be able to do at home? So uh, it's not uncommon at all for kids, especially kids your child's age, to act really differently at home and at school. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, often parents are very surprised that how well their children behave at school when at home there's lots of challenges. Um, the, you know, there, at home, um, we as parents are um, moderating our child's self regulation and what you or self management, what you described is, is, a, is, is exactly how we as adults can support our children learning these skills by, you know, holding them by help, you know, but that requires us to be calm, right? <laughs> and so to, to be present for your child in those moments can be really hard as a parent because they're reflecting parts of ourselves that we may also not necessarily like, right? <laughs> they're little mirrors for us. Uh, and so we have to really work as parents to um, calm ourselves down and to see our own tendency to um, uh, react or respond in ways that may not be ideal. And I just want to talk for a moment about something that we talk about in, in the work we do with teachers called scripts. Scripts, the way we describe that, are habitual thought and emotional patterns that we learn as children from our parents. Um, and when we're dealing with children, it's so easy for those to arise in, in, in our, and we don't see them because they're part of they're, they're, they come from, you know, unconscious, they form unconscious biases and things about how things are supposed to be, right? Um, and they're very deeply embedded in us because often they, they come with strong emotions. So for example, here's, here's an example. Um, 
in my childhood, being late was really bad. Um, and this was back during a time when you could actually go out and play without any adult supervision. So thinking back on it now, I can understand why my parents would be very upset if I was late because they were worried, where is she? What happened to her? You know, I was only six or seven or eight years old. Where the hell is she? You know, um, but as a little kid that age, I'm losing track of time. I don't know what time it is. I don't know when I'm supposed to be home. Um, eventually, they gave me a, a watch, which helped a lot, even though I didn't necessarily pay attention to it. But when I got home late, I got in big trouble. I mean, big trouble. Sometimes I got yelled at. Sometimes I think I even got spanked on occasion for being home late. So for me, it's deeply embedded in me and my physiology. Late is bad. To this day, when I am late for an appointment, I start feeling anxious because I'm afraid I'm going to be judged. I'm afraid I'm going to be criticized. Um, If other people are late, I can be very critical. The first thing that comes into my head is why are they being late? They must be disrespectful. So here's a script about lateness that I have. Um, So as an adult, as a parent, um, you know, it's easy for me to replicate that when my kid is late, I can get upset. I can get overreactive. Um, I tried hard as a parent not to spank my kid, but the impulse to do that was hard to recognize and to work around. Um, As a teacher, it's easy to project that onto my students. And um, so part of being a mindful teacher and parent is knowing that I have that script, knowing that it can interfere with the present moment, that can trigger overreactivity, and it can interfere with my understanding of my students too. So as a person interacting with children, we have to be really aware of this background, this baggage that we carry around with us, you know? Um, And so I think mindfulness can help us with that. And where I find it most helpful is when I'm feeling a strong emotion, because when I notice that, when I go, oh, wow, I'm feeling angry, or I'm feeling frightened, or whatever it is, it's a clue that there's probably a script going on here about how things are supposed to be. And if I can take a moment and step back, then I'm more able to really see what's happening and take the appropriate response to the situation rather than just automatically reacting. Um, And so in the classroom, you can see this play out, especially when teachers get stressed out. Because when you're stressed out, you're, you're more, you're, those, those scripts are easier to just automatically deploy without thinking. And I'll give you an example of one that, that I talk about in my books, because it's such a perfect example. We were teaching this program called CARE that I developed. It's for teachers. It stands for Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education. And we were in the first day of the class of the program, the workshop, and a teacher said to us, you know, my classroom is great. She just said this in the discussion. My classroom's great, except for this one kid who's driving me crazy. And we're like, well, what, what is, what's going on? You know? And she said, well, she comes to school late every single day. And I bring this up because I prefaced it with this script about lateness, right? Um, And we said, okay, well, what happens? She said, well, she comes in late and she just starts giggling and she disrupts the class. And, and, you know, I'm in the middle of a lesson. She's over there giggling. We don't know what to do. So, well, what, how do you respond to that? She says, well, I ask her, I put her for time out. I make her sit over in the corner and I say, well, what happens then? She goes, well, then she'll just sit over there and try to draw the attention from my class to her. And, you know, it, it just turns into a disaster. And we said, okay, you know, that's interesting. Well, maybe we'll learn more about what's going on here. And maybe we can figure out a solution. Anyway, we had, we came back after a couple of weeks for a set follow-up workshop. And she said, my class has completely changed. And we said, what happened? And she said, well, first of all, I realized from this workshop that I had never actually asked this child why she was coming to school late. Um, You know, I was just assuming that she was being disrespectful because I have a script about being late as being disrespectful. And I, it was making me angry and I was um, responding to her that way. Um, I asked her why she was late and she told us that 
she, uh, her mom was working at night and wasn't getting up in the morning to help her get to school. And she was getting to school by herself without any adult support. And this is a seven-year-old getting to school without any adult help. And when she heard that, you can imagine how that, how she felt differently about this child when she heard that story, you know, her heart opened up and she felt, oh my goodness, this child is trying her best to get to school. She also realized the reason she's giggling is she's embarrassed, right? It's not disrespect. It's shame and embarrassment. And she realized her approach was completely wrong. <laughs> so she shifted the way she responded to this child. She welcomed her. She helped. She started uh, talking to her about helping her find ways to get to school better. She accessed more resources for this child and it changed the whole um, the whole atmosphere in her class. So that's a way that that both teachers and parents can can apply mindfulness to how they interact with their students and children in ways that are more thoughtful and more supportive of of the children. Yeah, I like your example, and it's reminding us, reminding me of something that our school suggests as a semi-mindfulness practice when we're at home, uh, working with our children when they're facing a difficult emotion and acting out in a way that we don't prefer as parents say screaming is they try to find where the child is, where they are, like identify where they are. So you, you are feeling overwhelmed or scared because X, Y, Z, try to identify the issue, whether it's because you couldn't find the shoe you wanted. Oh, I see how that would be frustrating. And it's a starting point, right? Because it also, it doesn't always work. And that's another expectation. I think I have to work on and parents have to work on it's the suggestion that you do this means you try it over and over again as a practice and maybe five out of the 10 times the skill is slowly starting to develop both in you and your child uh, because there will be times when identifying their emotion and helping them link that to their behavior is not going to work and they're just going to melt down uh, but yeah, the schools have helped us also through our Zooms at this point to work on these skills and to notice exactly what you were saying in your example, that your child is starting from somewhere. And if you can identify where they're beginning, you can perhaps in some scenarios work them towards the more pro-social behavior or the better behavior that you're looking for. Uh, and then at the level of being the adult in the room, you're reminding me of something that just happened to us yesterday. Uh, you know, my son is all about costumes right now. He knows Halloween is on the verge and he's wearing a cat outfit from one of these shows that he found. And we don't always think it's a great idea that he wears, you know, costumes every time we go out because, you know, what's a fear that I might have? I think we were walking towards the playground and I was like, oh, no other kids are wearing costumes is this going to affect his ability to socialize with other kids? And I'm, I'm like processing this as I'm walking because I imagine teachers, I'm going to link this with teachers because it's probably something they have to do all the time. It's what's the boundary that you are then imposing on them. And I was like, well, if I tell them to take off this costume, perhaps they'll have a better time with the other kids. And maybe they won't perhaps make fun of them. Cause I noticed, especially there were some older kids so I was getting nervous, like, oh, he hasn't really been made fun of fully yet. And then I had to stop and be like, oh, but I'm still, that's stealing something. Once again, here I am trying to steal the experience that he may have to navigate discomfort. And then I, I'm glad I was aware of that. And I didn't interrupt because I could have done, if I would have said, let's take off the costume, I could have put him in a bad mood and just ruined the entire social scenario. And maybe he would have projected that onto other kids and just had a terrible time. But luckily I didn't say anything and you know, nothing happened. He said he met a best friend and no one made fun of them. And it, that would have been fine too. So I imagine your example of teachers and I can't believe teachers do this because I know teachers are parents too. I sometimes see my teachers for all of, for my son at school. And I'm thinking, how did they come here knowing that they just also dropped their kid off? I mean, how do you not get burnt out? I mean, I barely, in the morning when my son finally gets in the car and is willing to leave to school, I have to like take 10 minutes of breathing to be like, okay, let's get focused on your day. 
you just were completely depleted and it's only been an hour. It's eight o'clock in the morning, right? So how, I think this is your expertise with all of that example, like the boundaries and the burnout, how does a person manage that as a career? It sounds tough. It's really, really tough in so many ways. Um, you know, the, and, and what, there's all of that that you just described, but then there's also, especially in the public school systems, there's this huge, massive, monstrous system that that uh, public school teachers have to navigate that's really, really difficult. And my last book, Teacher Burnout Turnaround, I focus a lot on the system because one of the criticisms I got, and I think it's a really good criticism, is, you know, you can teach teachers all these mindfulness skills to cope with the with the stressors that are that they experience in the classroom that we've been describing but what about the system and how it impacts them you know you you, you know if you say it's mind that mindfulness can help them with that then you're just basically asking them to be passive um, you know, that, that, you know, that mindfulness cannot solve those problems. And they're right. Mindfulness cannot solve the problems of the system and how it imposes itself on teachers other than the, other than helping teachers understand that system and find ways to hack that system from the inside, which is what I was hoping my book would help with. <laughs> um, because, uh, it's easy to feel powerless. It's easy to feel like a victim in that context. It's easy to feel like um, the system doesn't care about you. And it's actually true. The system does not care about teachers. Um, so so I hope that my book helps teachers see better the, the history of the system, how the system got to be the way it is, and the ways in which they might empower themselves um, to help build a better system from the bottom up. Because I think teachers are best positioned to understand how the system could be changed and how we might make it better. Um, one of the things that really struck me as I was working on this book is I was reading up on the history of schools, public schools in the United States. And if you think back on that time when schools were being, being scaled, which was kind of the turn of the last century, um, what did we know about scaling back then? I mean, the only thing we had to think about in terms of scaling was a factory. Factories were growing up in big cities. People were manufacturing things for the first time and, and creating, um, you know, uh, assembly lines and things like that. And so they modeled the first school systems after this factory. And you see that the, the um, remnants of that everywhere. Um, you see uh, an assembly line, basically, that and that expects kids to be the same across different ages. You know, a five-year-old should be like this. A six-year-old should be like this. A seven-year-old should be like this. Kids don't develop that way. There's a lot of variability in development. And you can't say all seven-year-olds need the same thing. It just doesn't work that way. Um, the other thing you see is siloed curricula. So here's math. Here's language arts. Here's history. That's not how those kinds of content areas actually function. They are interwoven. Language arts and social studies can be easily integrated and, and math and science can be easily integrated. And that's the way we work in the real world. Um, you know, <laughs> there, you need, when you're solving a problem, you might need a mathematician, but that mathematician is going to be working with an engineer and they're going to be working with, you know, a, a marketing or, or business person. You know, they're all going to be working together on something. It's not going to be separated, separated out like that. Um, also, the whole school day is, is, is uh, organized by timeframes where learning is expected to occur within a 40 minute block, you know, and if, if I'm trying to do something, if I artificially say, well, I only have 40 minutes to do this, that's going to be really difficult. I might just get into the thick of it by the time the 40 minutes are over and I'll have to stop and go do something else. But that's not the way we work or do things these days. So schools really need to completely rethink how we do this. <laughs> Can we talk more about, I'm, I'm really glad you have a history here in studying how we have evolved the concept of schooling. So where are we today? So you said it's the factory-based idea. And of course, a system evolved 
for the culture of its time and it made sense for the folks of the time, right? So I imagine my grandfather on a farm in Sioux City, Iowa, would definitely want schools to go as long as they could because, you know, until his child, my parents (laughs) were old enough to help out, they were more of a nuisance, right? Because Mm -hmm. they needed to get things done to survive. And before that, you can imagine it was even more challenging if crops weren't doing well um, or the service career wasn't doing well in sales, depending on what what people were doing at the time as a vocation. Um, So we see the, the need, the necessity, and then the evolution of vocations and culture and technology that kind of stripped us out of those things, but happened so fast, we can't really identify what we should be doing, but maybe you've entertained a lot of ideas. So we had something that worked that we needed. Now something that is lingering, perhaps it's not working as much, but um, can you talk about that system? Because it still seems, at least from my perspective with a two parent working household, we haven't extricated ourselves from that time demand and so how would we do it any differently do we just rely completely on schools to still reform but it still has to be those hours and just figure it out from that from that eight to five for example Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how do we do it if parents still can't fully become integrated with that system if the schools Mm -hmm. are going to go alone Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well I think um I think you're right. I, I think I, there's two things. And first of all, I think we need year round school. Um, I think the idea that, you know, we have these long summer breaks, which comes from that agrarian history where you wanted those kids to help out at certain times, you know, you know, cause you needed the harvest or whatever, or to work during the summer. Uh, there's no reason not to have 12 month school at all. I mean, adults work on 12 month basis. They don't work on a nine month basis. So that's number one. The other thing is I think school should go longer. Um, You know, it should go from, I don't know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. instead of, you know, getting done at three, because that, again, is also a remnant, um, because also uh, there's two two parts where of this story where the demand actually falls on women primarily in the history. You know, women were didn't get really you know, women weren't fully engaged in the workforce until probably the 80s, right? Before that, a lot of women were at home with the kids. Um, Number two, when the school systems were scaled and they were trying to be economically viable, they relied on women to be the teachers because at the time they could pay them a third of what they were going to pay men. So the whole, the, so the whole system was built on the backs of women and lowly, lowly paid women. Um, so I think that first, we need more time for schools, which is going to require more personnel, more, more, it's going to cost more because you've got to pay more people to actually work more hours to provide this service for families. Number two, I think uh, there's ways in which we can easily shift from this sort of silo-based um, content curriculum to a more integrated approach that's more project-based. Uh, and there are examples of this going on. I, in my book, I cite a school here locally that is, it's a public charter um, that's experimental and it's completely project-based. The, everything they do is based in a project and kids work collaboratively on solving problems and doing projects that they come up with. Uh, and all of their curricula that they have to learn is woven into that project. And the teachers who do that, they know, okay, this is, they. well, sorry, I'm going to back up for a second because what they do at the beginning of the project is they tell the kids, they're very transparent about the learning expectations. They tell them, these are the standards of learning for your grade. This is what you have to learn this year. You should, so how do you want to learn that? And what project do you want to do to help you learn that? Instead of the other way around, which is the way we've been doing it, it's like, okay, our kids need to learn long multiplication. Okay, so we're going to, to give them a lesson in long multiplication, and we're going to drill them on it. And so that sort of drill and kill, you know, we're going to drill instead of like, how might kids learn long division in a project that's looking at how we might improve our uh, energy use, right? You know, 
So, so it's a really different way of thinking about curriculum and the needs of children, of kids. One of the things that's striking to me is when I went, when I've observed that class in school and have visited that school, the ideas of the projects the kids want to do are amazing. Um, the, when I observed recently, they were doing, um, uh, projects around climate change and how they might think about climate change and what they might do themselves to re- reduce the impact of, of CO2, <laughs> you know, and these were middle school and high school. No, these were middle school kids that I was observing. So they were like 12, 13 year olds. They had some great ideas and that's what, you know, they were so engaged. They were so excited about what they were doing. And so were the adults. And what I noticed about this school is that the, the level of stress in that school was very low. The teachers were calm, the kids were calm, everybody was happy and everybody was busy. And it made me feel like we, it gave me a lot of hope because I thought if this can happen here, it can happen anywhere. So those are a couple of the things that I think we need to rethink in terms of how we um, build, rebuild our educational systems to be more um, aligned with the way we work today. Um, another part of this that I think is important to understand is when we scaled schools back in, I don't know, the early 1900s, the expectation was that our children would be learning at about the fourth grade level today, because that's kind of where most adults landed. Unless you were going into a profession, you know, you that's about the level of learning everybody had. Today, that kind of learning you can learn much more quickly and easily than back then. So what people were learning at the fourth grade level back in 1910, kids now can learn up, you know, by first, second grade, really. And what we need to learn is so much more advanced today than was necessary back then, too. So that's another part of this this issue that um, we need to think about. And so along with those curriculum shifts, so there's a reprogramming and restructuring and I hear you on the timing so uh, let me touch on that and then I'll get back to my point about what what we do with mindfulness then in the case of a curriculum like this um, the summer schooling idea has I've never thought about this until I had children so if you don't have children you may not think about summer schooling you may have memories of being happy during during summers I have wonderful memories of summers but you're right on that what do parents do we are still working and nothing has changed for us so what we will do is just retool the schooling idea in a different version camp etc and then so it just puts more pressure on the parents more financial pressure and some people can't do this right so we're lucky enough to be able to do it to then find new programs so it's basically just retooling school once again and we do it through summer. And it makes summers very challenging for parents. We miss days of work. We take sick days and all of these things. When your program seems that we could do something similar on a project-based level, maybe summers are more outdoors activities, and that seems fine. So I'm, on, I'm with you on that. And maybe some parents will definitely not be because they're like, that's the time I can spend quality time with my kids, which totally get. And that can be by choice. But it's an unresolved issue, right? We just expect that parents can figure out what to do for three months. And it's a it's kind of just a, something, a black box that we pretend does not exist. That parent, It's a huge challenge for parents. Um, the extended hours, you're right at three o'clock. So this, we, in the, our current school, and I'm assuming from what you're saying, it's common to go until three o'clock. Well, what time does the standard workday end for adults? Five o'clock. And so we're all well, cutting our days short. Uh, taking days off, adding up hours, which we're not at work. And it's like, okay, why are we doing this? And what we do is pay for an additional program. And many people can't do this. So I think you're addressing two major issues and they're extremely practical issues. Um, And then what happens in those hours? And I've thought about this a lot. The two additional hours, my child is home. Are they actually gaining as much if they were back at school? When they're actually engaging with peers on the slide, running around, using their bodies. My son keeps telling me, daddy, play with me. I don't have the imagination anymore. I mean, I can play to a certain extent, but I am not where he is in the world of imagination. 
And that, what does that bring about? Some frustration. So in that way, parents can only do so much anyway. Uh, so this, and I imagine that Tish, this brings forth the guilt idea, like, but what about the guilt that parents are feeling? Like, I can't, my wife deals with this all the time, but we can't leave them there. What's going to happen? I'm like, well, I don't know. He seems pretty happy <laughs> when we pick him up. Uh, so teach, I mean, parents is also people who can become guilt ridden, burnt out by the whole system of challenges through summer. Our mindfulness features, trying to bring it back to our mindfulness world here. How can that be as a tool for parents to deal with hard emotions, to accept that maybe the structure would be better for their child? Well, I think um, one thing is, you know, as I was thinking about how we might transform our schools, the, the two communities that have the biggest stake in this are parents and teachers. And teachers are the biggest profession in the United States. If you add up the preschool and special ed and private school teachers, there are 6 million teachers in the United States. And then if you look at the parents, there's a lot of parents too, because most children have two, mostly. Um, And so if you think about the number of children times two, that's a lot of parents. If parents and teachers could collaborate and work together together, I think changing the system would not be difficult at all. Um, The problem is that um, we have to recognize that we have the, the, um, the power to do this and we have to be able to see um, how it might change. And I think mindfulness can help us think outside the box is what I think. I think when we are able to realize that we're maybe living in an archaic system or that our mental and, and cognitive, our cognitive and our emotional functions are um, based in something in the past that happened in the past. When we can see that, it opens the door for all kinds of possibilities. I think that's where mindfulness can help us move our whole world into a new place because we can see through these systems. We can see this is just a system. This is just you know, why do we have to be attached to this system? We can create a new system. Um, we can also use systems thinking and, and project, I mean, uh, systems and um, uh, yeah, systems thinking and uh, design thinking to rethink our schools. <laughs> and I think, I think this is where, where mindfulness can be most helpful is just in innovation and creativity we know that there's, there's evidence of that um, to, to, but we haven't really fully explored how to apply that in the real world, right? We do it in an, in, we do it on a personal level. I think, I think you see that a lot with, um, you know, people who have really embraced this mindfulness based approach to things. We see shifts, we see small shifts in people's lives, but we haven't seen a whole cultural shift yet we're starting to um but i think the potential is really there i really do yes it's i this question interests me quite a bit it's what have we inherited and what is useful about that and then what needs to be built upon so just in our conversation it seems like the structure was inherent inherited and we still like the structure so we like having our children remote in a place that is secure. Uh, I don't know if like secure was the topic of the day back when we we still had child labor, but I'm sure parents still wanted their child to be safe and um, a certain number of hours. So it was, uh, could be determined when my child had to be dropped off and picked up. And I know how many hours in the day I can be free to focus on vocational and other tasks. Um, and then we want some type, it seems like a third piece is that some type of program in place that makes my child a pr- both a productive citizen. So the social elements that this, my child can contribute to, for example, not hurting others. Like I don't want my, you know, I think most parents are uh, devastated by the fact that their child ever hurt another child. Like, it's unbelievable. And they just, they probably don't know what to do with it. I haven't been there yet, but I'm sure it would. it's going to be a hard pill to swallow if that ever happens. Um, so the social embarrassment of that, the fear that your child is heading in a bad direction towards deviance, um, 
And then also the, so, and major, of major importance is also the curriculum to develop the practical skills needed to transition into an adult role, right? So all of these have been inherited, extremely important. So it doesn't seem like we would relinquish the major foundations of education. It's retooling it. And for what purpose? I think that's the question. That's where I lead up to in my solution. It's like, and, and to do what, right? So mm-hmm. what's new? And you brought up some issues with project-based that an individual can take responsibility and leadership on a project. Um, and then what, and, and it has empathy and social and emotional elements. So we're learning the importance. Like if we don't want that deviance, perhaps we'll, we'll teach self-management and mindfulness skills. Uh, and then what else about the curriculum? Like what's the retooling? Well, one of the things I've thought a lot about and um, is that the the rate of change today, this the, the in our social cultural world, it is so fast right now that it's very hard to predict what our children need to know and be able to do. Um, back, you know, at the turn of when our grandparents were, you know, my parents, your grandparents were, um, were growing up, it was pretty, everybody knew what a kid was going to need to know and be able to do. It was predictable. But today, I don't think it is. <laughs> um, but I do know that our kids are going to need to be resilient. They're going to need to know how to do things in teams and collaborate and cooperate together because all of the problems we have are so complex that individual people cannot solve individual problems. They're, um, we need a whole community to solve these problems. Um, they're going to need to be creative and good problem solvers and, and good thinkers about um, and have a, have a really flexible thinking capacity uh, because these problems are going to need new ways of thinking. <laughs> it's like Einstein. I think he said something like, you can't solve the problems uh, with the same kind of thinking that that created the problems. <laughs> I, I know I'm not paraphrasing that exactly, but so, um, and and I do feel like, I do feel hopeful because I see this even with the undergraduates I work with. There is a, a yearning and a hunger for thinking differently and for extending the way and, and being more creative and more flexible in the way we think. So um, I think, I think finding ways to create schools where those are the, the skills that we're, we're working towards and not worrying so much about um, the actual nuts and bolts of certain kinds of skills. Cause right now, the other, the other part of this is that the system is set up to monitor using testing um, a child's knowledge in a very narrow way that doesn't really capture what we want our kids to to know. Um, It's impossible to create a test that isn't just a subsample of things we want them to know. Um, And so when a child does poorly on a standardized test, to me, that is really not very meaningful at all. Um, You know, it doesn't really tell me much about what, where that child actually is developmentally. It's a very limited um, thing. The other part of this is that in today's world, we need all the diversity. We we need to muster all of our human diversity. Um, And when you look at the, the, the diversity of any particular quality of a person, you've got, you know, a range uh, that extends from, zero capacity to extremely fantastic capacity. And and if you think about all the different capacities that we have as human beings, um, we want to, we want all of these. So the school looks at a very narrow window of these capacities. So for example, as a teacher, uh, I might see a good student and I'm putting finger quote, air quotes around that a good student as a child who can sit still, a child who can focus attention, a child who can uh, do math at a certain level, read at a certain level, blah, blah. But that totally eliminates a child who is particularly good at thinking creatively and um, artistically in some area that, you know, won't even show up on that map. You know what I mean? 
So they end up being these outliers that don't fit into this, this system and they aren't acknowledged for the value they have to contribute. And so they end up feeling like they don't belong um, or they get into trouble because they're bored and, or they, or they don't see the, the relevance of what they're being asked to do, but they have a capacity that we want to utilize and cultivate because we know it's valuable. So I think we need to extend and expand uh, this understanding of what is valuable and and what to cultivate. Um, And yes, kids need to learn long multiplication. (laughs) They do, but that's not that hard. And besides, we all have calculators now. So even if you're not really good at long multiplication, you can use your calculator, right? (laughs) Yeah. And this reminds me of undergraduate teaching that I do. Um, and your point about critical thinking skills more generally and capacities more generally, and perhaps a project-based system would help with that. So one downside to that system, because I imagine my role as educator, and when you develop more complicated projects for students, we are going to need a larger teaching force, right? Because that immediately increases the demand to work with us. It's much more interesting. It's much more fun. It's much more unveiling of the potentials of that student, but there is so much work as it's drafting and it's formulating re and reformulating that idea. And it's a, it's a down the line process where the learning is the process and there is an uncovering of what this student really wants to do. And that is like critical thinking, right? It's like you thought through this and found the solution as one possible solution. Woo, that is a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Um, so I could see why we baseline and we uh, why we have inherited testing because it's you can do it now. It can be on a computer. You can get the score. It's easily readable, and we can give feedback to the child. So I see, as you're saying, I was like, I still see some importance because as a screening tool, you'd want to know where the problems are, right? So you identify, okay, that even though they're great in this domain of art and language they're really struggling here and we don't want to just let them fall through the cracks we want to make sure they have the basic understanding so they can balance their checkbook right um so there there's that challenge um so there's there's the piece about um what we might be able to do with the curriculum and it sounds great and perhaps we can do it maybe we need more teachers and then when they make it as i was saying to the undergrad you can see the remnants of perhaps over focus on scores and that's what i would say like the outcome focus because as like juniors and seniors in college and they've been through a private university and seen the liberal arts piece and they've seen the quantitative piece and the sciences and they've merged these and they're still asking me but what about the specific scoring and can we do multiple choice? And in that moment, it's like my heart breaks because I'm like, oh, you're still so concerned about that. There, there's so many wonderful things we're learning together, uh, but that's the testing is what we have focused on. And you'll see the, the variability across students, those that have kind of gotten past that and those who haven't. And perhaps that's a remnant of that very system you're talking about. It's, I was focused on these scoring numbers and by the time, and now I'm going to graduate this year and you wonder, oh, okay, but what are you going to move forward? What are you carrying forward with that type of mentality? Did we ever figure out the critical thinking? And that's not this. I'm sure there are capacities and skills there for those students for sure. Um, but sometimes they miss the bigger picture. And it, I was just connecting that. It sounds like that what the project-based curriculum might be. Yeah, I, I see the same thing. Um, this cohort, um, the, the, I don't know, last many cohorts have, you know, they grew up with no child left behind, you know, and the, the testing became more and more um, rigid and standardized. I mean, it, the reliance on testing increased over those years. And you see it, especially in universities like yours and mine, where, you know, they're the sort of the cream of the crop students, you know. They're the ones that are really obsessed over grades and scores and test scores and um, at the, you know, almost to the point where it's obsessive in many cases, I would say. Um, well, I see there's, there's two things I can see that we might be able to solve some of these problems. For one thing, um, now with big data and with 
uh, the internet and with, you know, all the technologies we have, it would not be that difficult to create some kind of a platform where you could, ha- I could have my students, if I'm a K-12 teacher, I could have my students go in to their computers and they all have laptops nowadays, go in, play a game for half an hour every day. And I would be able to get a report every day about what this kid knows how to do. There could be math games, it could be reading games, it could be everything. And then every day I could say, oh, you know, my whole class is doing great, except there's a couple kids here who are really having trouble with reading here right now, or this particular math skill. Then what I can do is they they can be working on their projects or whatever. And I could just make sure that with those particular kids, I give them a little bit of extra attention and do a little bit more um, investigation to diagnose exactly what's going on here and what the issue is and support them. And meanwhile, they don't even have to know that that's going on in the background. You know, they're getting the support they need. They don't have to see, oh, I've got a deficit somewhere or there's a problem somewhere, Um, you know, and then as the day, as the year goes on, I can watch and see how it's improving over time. And I can let the parents know, give them some tips about things that they could do at home to support this learning. And I don't think we would run into the same kinds of barriers we do because often we don't even notice that these are happening until the test and then it's too late and then you know and then we've got to do remediation and then we've got to put them in special ed and blah blah but if you are monitoring in real time as it's going you can easily uh, support kids when they need that learning instead of waiting until the test Um, the other part of this is if this was built this is in my imagination these data could become really useful for research purposes because right now in schools, when we do a big study, uh, it's really cumbersome. To do a randomized trial in a school is really hard. And right now I'm doing one in Chicago and it is the hardest thing in the world in the midst of COVID to do a randomized trial. If we had really reliable data at this level across the United States, we could do, we could use epidemiology to monitor how our kids are doing in, in large scale, rather than doing what we're doing right now. And then we could do little tweaks to the system to improve outcomes. And we'd know right away if what we were doing was making a difference or not. And we wouldn't have to wait till the end of a five-year randomized trial to see if something works. This randomized trial approach doesn't work either when things are changing so rapidly, right? Um, When we started this trial that I'm working on in Chicago, we had no idea that COVID was going to disrupt the whole thing, you know? (laughs) So I I see in the, this is sort of my future vision that if we could harness what we now have, the capacity we have with using big data, using technology, um, th- this whole problem would would not be a problem anymore. I like this strategy. And see, I'm not versed enough to see what has been inherited versus where we need to go. But just as one strategy, uh, I like this because it reminds me of what we might call fidelity in the research world, rather than waiting for the big moment, did we prepare? And here's your one chance, like to take this test. And then here you get your point on the normal distribution of peers. If you're taking assessments, say, you know, daily or depending on the timelines of the classroom weekly, and given that we have the computer-based technology to probably develop some really good programs to see where students are, it tells us in real time the fidelity, the process of are you doing something correctly in your implementation of education at scale? And so um, you can determine in a very practical way both the students who are not succeeding so well, as well as the content and the material that works well in mm-hmm. real time. So, yeah, why this makes me beg, this begs the question it seems like we can build technology for anything at this moment. I mean, the dating apps that have changed all of our culture in the last just few years tells you the potency uh, and the social media platforms that we can do things and that data can be used for anything. But perhaps data is not being used at all for the most important uh, system of of that all we have, right? Our children being educated. Um, Do you, like, why? why? Why not? Is there no money to be extracted here from teaching the next generation and uh, building their skills properly? 
Well, you know, this, this points to a, a kind of a bigger issue that I, I think, you know, when I think about all of our problems today that we're facing, we have the capacity to solve all of them. We do. I mean, we know enough about um, chemistry and biology and physics and, and data and, you know, technology. We know we have everything we need to solve these problems. What we don't have is the will to do it. And, um, and I think some of it has to do with um, inertia. I think there's a certain kind of, I think human beings tend to be, to, to not want to change. They like things to be predictable and want things to be the way they've always been. But the problem is they're not the way they've always been anyway. <laughs> and we're not going back. We can't go backwards, which you see, you know, there's this sort of, the, I think you, a lot of the maybe political issues right now arise from this wish for things to go backwards or things to say the way they were, because somehow the way they were was okay back in the old days or whatever. We, we aren't going back. We're not, it's just not happening. So let's bring ourselves fully forward. <laughs> you know, uh, let's embrace all of these um, possibilities and, and, and really, I I, th- I see that it's happening in a very small way, and and when it does happen, it also results sometimes in this backlash because people get frightened. You know, they get frightened by uh, oh my gosh, if we throw out testing, oh no, then all the children will fail. You know, <laughs> it's kind of this all or nothing thinking that we tend to have as human beings. Um, human beings are very adaptable. If you think about our history. It's amazing. It really is. It's truly amazing that we started out as, you know, I don't know, a small population of of uh, hominids on the coast of Africa somewhere, you know, and here we are all over the whole entire planet, you know, um, but we at every stage of our of our development and our process, we've had to kind of rethink the way we do things. And we're at another one of those inflection points where we really have to rethink the way we're doing things. Um, And I, and I see it happening, I hope. Oh, wonderful. And we can conclude on that for today. Thank you, Dr. Jennings. It was wonderful having you. Um, We probably could have a second conversation. We didn't even touch the most of the mindfulness world stuff because the, the conversation on the education system itself was so much fun. I really appreciate your time. Thank you well, so it was much. Really fun. I, I, I enjoyed talking to you, David. <laughs> Me too. Our listeners can find our recordings at goamra.org. That's G O A M R A.org, where you can support us by becoming a member or a subscriber. That's it for today. Bye now.